The battlefield in Ukraine has flared up this much for the first time in a long time. The great offensive plans of the Ukrainians continued to advance successfully on the front lines between the Donetsk region and the Zaporizhia Oblast. The attacks of the Ukrainian army in Zaporizhia started about a week ago. Ukrainians primarily targeted the city of Orykiv. Clashes still continue in Vasilivka in the southwest of the city and in Poloy in the southeast. However, with the start of military activities in other fronts of Zaporizhia, the intensity of clashes in these two cities decreased a little bit. The Russians are having trouble providing military support to these two critical settlements and Orykiv due to the logistics problems of the Russians. The advances of the Ukrainian army in Zaporizhia Orykiv spread to the southern front lines of Ukraine and the Donetsk steppes. In time, when we look at today, the Ukrainian army is narrowing the Zaporizhia Donetsk front line to the Russians with its tanks, rifles, special forces, western weapons and military vehicles. As a result of the Russian army's encounter with the Ukrainian army, special forces infantry units, tank units consisting of M1, Bradley and Leopard, two combat vehicles on the southern front lines. Kiev was able to retake seven settlements in a very short time. The capture of seven cities by the Ukrainians in a short period of time, such as one week, greatly changed the course of the war. In addition, the withdrawal of the Russians from these cities is about to collapse. The curse on Zaporizhia Donetsk connection of the Russian army, and as the Ukrainians find this gap in the war, they continue to increase their offensive operations day by day. So where are these seven regions that the Ukrainian army took back and what is the latest situation in these critical areas? The first stop of the critical offensive operations of the Ukrainians on the Zaporizhia Donetsk line was the Storozev settlement in Storozev. The soldiers of Russia's 60th Motor Brigade were trying to resist critical attacks by the 108th Defense Brigade and 128th Regional Defense Brigade of the Ukrainian Army. Parallel to the route where the 68th Jaeger Brigade of the Ukrainian Army came. That is east of Storozev, the 37th Motorized Brigade of the Russian Army was located. However, against three special forces of the Ukrainian Army, the Russian Army was able to send only two military special forces to the city of Storozev. The numerical superiority was on the Ukrainian side. Therefore, Ukrainian special forces were able to blockade Storozev from the north and northeast directions. The Russian special forces, on the other hand, began to withdraw towards the central front lines of the city of Storozev and continued their defense mission in this area. But with Ukrainian army support of the 68th Jaeger Brigade, the 108th Defense Brigade and the 128th Territorial Defense Brigade, Russian special forces and other infantry units in Storozev came under massive fire. After several hours of clashes, Ukrainian special forces managed to completely repulse the Russians in Storozev and captured this city in the village of Storozev. The soldiers were seen holding the Ukrainian flag along the Makaryeli River, which flows northward from the Russian-controlled area. But the capture of Storozev was only the beginning for Kiev's offensive plans because the Ukrainian forces continued to advance towards the south and north of Storozev. After capturing this city, just like the war strategy they carried out in the city of Orykiv, the Ukrainians dispersed in Storozev from two branches simultaneously Neskikny and Makarovka. Settlements along the offensive line of the Ukrainians were taken from the Russians from the city of Neskikny, located north of Storozev. Russian troops were completely withdrawn and the Russians had to surrender this area to the Ukrainians. On the other hand, the Russians were defeated in the city of Makievka, located in the south of Storozev on the same day. As a result, Makievka became the third settlement liberated by Ukrainian forces. Other Ukrainian troops advancing along Mercurially were engaged in fierce clashes for another city on this critical line of attack. The fourth settlement that the Ukrainians tried to save was the city of Blahodat. This place was liberated as a result of the long efforts of the 68th Separate Hunting Brigade of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. 
There were historical moments after the liberation of the city by the Ukrainians. A video shared showing them proudly flying the Ukrainian flag on a damaged building in Blahodat. This video was shared by the 68th Jaeger Brigade of the Ukrainian Army. In addition, Brigade spokesman Miroslav Semenyuk reported that his assault team was seen entering several buildings where about 60 Russian soldiers took shelter and most of these soldiers were captured. Presumably, these 60 Russian soldiers must have been the last Russian troops to defend Blahodat in response to this unstoppable advance of the Ukrainians. The Russian army increased the construction of defensive fortifications, both in Zaporizhia and in the areas of this region close to Donetsk. That is on the front lines where clashes were most intense. But the Ukrainians had placed such a system in this critical corridor that whatever the Russian troops did, the attack plans created by the Ukrainians worked like clockwork. The greatest evidence of this was the continuation of the advance of the Ukrainian forces after Blahodat. Ukrainian Deputy Defense Minister Malaha reported in a telegram post that Ukrainian forces also recaptured Livadia and Novogorgievka, about 10 kilometers west of Mercurially and Lobkov, southeast of the city of Zaporizhia. With the last three cities announced by Anna Malier, the number of settlements that the Ukrainians liberated from the Russians had increased to seven in total. Instead of stopping, the Ukrainians continued to pierce the Russian trenches and were raging on the southern front lines, particularly in the territory of the Zaporizhia Oblast. Livadia and Novo Fedorov are two settlements close to each other. The distance between these two cities is about seven kilometers. While Anamalia did not make a clear statement about which of the two cities was liberated first, some Ukrainian military officials claim that simultaneous offensive operations were carried out in both cities. Lobkov is located in the Vasilyevsky district and the city is about 100 kilometers from Livadia and Novogorgievka. But Lobkov is much closer to Orykiv. So the Ukrainians are likely to focus on the city of Orykiv again because with the capture of Lukov by the Ukrainian forces, a much broader perspective was captured in the west of Orykiv and this is how the great offensive plans of the Ukrainians saved seven cities from the Russians. So what is the latest situation in this critical clash area right now? And what were the steps taken by the Russians against the advances made by the Ukrainian forces? First of all, we should point out that even the Russians did not anticipate that the Ukrainians would seize seven cities in such a short period of time. Currently, as we mentioned in the video, this critical clash arena between Zaporizhia and Donetsk has been in a very complicated situation for about two weeks. Russian troops were already conducting a scattered defense mission in these areas, but as a result of the harsh and pressured offensive operations of the Ukrainians, the defense missions and fortifications of the Russians were also destroyed. The command of the Russians in this region also collapsed. The top military official, literally the head of the Russian forces in Zaporizhia, was killed as a result of the massive offensive plans of the Ukrainians. Vladimir Rogov, one of the Russian officials in the southern Zaporizhia region, officially announced that the chief of general staff of the 35th Army of Russia, Major General Sergei Goryachev, was killed on the Zaporizhia front, where the Ukrainian forces recaptured some areas. Goryachev, 52, was a high-ranking officer. Throughout his career, he fought in the Second Chechen War, commanded a tank brigade, oversaw Russian military base in Tajikistan and led Russian forces in Moldova's separatist pro-Russian Transnistria region. Most importantly, the Russian army lost its top military officer on the Zaporizhia front, where the Ukrainians are currently making incredible progress. This loss of the Russian army could cause serious problems for Vladimir Putin's troops in Zaporizhia in the coming days. Russian soldiers in this region may lose their morale from the war as the command echelon collapses. This, in turn, could enable the Ukrainians to seize all of Zaporizhia. 
The Russian army is now on the path of losing its title as one of the strongest military forces in the world. Before the Ukrainian war, the Russian armed forces was considered the second best army in the world. But the powerful Western weapons in the Ukrainian army crushed the invincible weapons of the Russian army. Us made weapons played a huge role in this success of the Ukrainian army. High-level military equipment in the inventory of the U.S. Army was sent to Ukraine to support Kiev. The Washington administration has provided nearly $50 billion in military and humanitarian aid to the Ukrainians since the beginning of the war. A State Department data showed that Washington supplied Kiev with 1,600 Stinger anti-aircraft man pads, over 8,500 Javel in anti-tank systems, more than 700 switchblade tactical drone systems and 142 155mm howitzers. In addition, the rest of this list included in a wide range of military equipment, weapons, ammunition and defense systems, including 36 105mm howitzers, 8 NASAMS air defense systems, 20 Mu-17 helicopters and 45 T-72B tanks. In addition, the U.S. Department of Defense stated that it supplied 109M to a two Bradley Heavy Armored Combat Vehicles to Ukraine. A battalion M1 Abrams tank will be deployed on the Ukrainian fronts as soon as possible. These mostly American-made systems made the Ukrainian army superior to the Russian army on land. However, until now, Ukraine and Russia had not been able to achieve their dominance at the front. For this, the Ukrainian administration demanded powerful warplanes and air defense systems from the USA and the West. Ukrainian cities were still not fully protected against Russian missile retaliation. For this, the USA, UK, France and Germany sent their powerful air defense systems to the Ukrainian army. Air defense systems such as NASAMS, IRIST and Kratal have achieved a success rate of more than 95% against Russian missiles and UAVs. However, there was still no solution against Russia's hypersonic missiles. For this reason, the Kiev administration requested Patriot Air Defense Systems from Washington. The Patriot Air Defense System has proven itself in many areas, but it has not fought against hypersonic missiles until now. While Moscow despised the Patriot Air Defense Systems, the Ukrainian people placed high hopes on the Patriots. It recently achieved a historic success against the Russian Army's most successful hypersonic missiles and warplanes. Russia launched a wave of missile and drone strikes in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, a day after two drones exploded near the Kremlin in Moscow. After a series of serial air strikes and explosions in Russian cities such as Moscow, St. Petersburg, Crimea, Krasnodar, Bryansk, Belgorod, and Kursk, last week, the Russian army carried out the heaviest missile strike of the war on Ukrainian cities. Ukraine's Western Air Defense successfully destroyed Russian Kamikaze UAVs and missiles. The Russian army rallied heavily on hypersonic missiles, but Patriot Air Defense Systems proved to be the god of war. It was quite remarkable that the Russian Air Force used 47 missiles in its attacks in Kiev. This Kins hull missile was fired from Russian soil by a MiG-31 of the Russian Air Force. But most of these Russian attacks were blocked by the Ukrainian air defense. Ukrainian forces recently confirmed that they had successfully shot down a Russian 47 meters squared Kins hull hypersonic missile over Kiev. The blocking of Kins sail by the US designed MIM 104 Patriot surface to air missile system created a bombshell effect. In other words, the U.S. made Patriot Air Defense System used by the Ukrainian Armed Forces has accomplished the impossible by shooting down the Russians' invincible missile Kins Hole. The U.S. made Patriot Air Defense System achieved a first in history with its 100% success and hit rate against Russian hypersonic missile systems. This shocking news clarified earlier conflicting reports about whether one of the cutting-edge weapons had been destroyed. The announcement was made by the Ukrainian Air Force commander, Lt. Gen. Mykola Oleskzuk, who described the event as a historical event on the social media platform. 
Telegram, if you remember, Putin speaking when he introduced the council, claimed that the missile was unstable to air defense systems. Of course, having such a missile provides serious advantages in the field of armed struggle. The power of this missile, as military experts say, can be enormous and its speed makes it vulnerable to today's missile defense and air defense systems. But the Patriots, the US air defense system used by the Ukrainian armed forces completely broke this taboo. Ukrainian Air Force spokesman Yuri Ignat stated that the downing of Kinshole was a slap in the face to Russia. After the downing of its most powerful missiles, the general situation and course of the Russian Air Force began to seriously come to the fore. Russian pilots failed to take much action to support their troops on the ground due to po training and outdated equipment, according to a report by the top British think tank Royal United Services Institute. The report, released this week outlined the strengths and weaknesses of Russia's air force in Ukraine based on a series of interviews with intelligence services, military experts and Ukrainian Air Force commanders. Since Russia first invaded in February of last year, it was already known that one of its biggest failures in Ukraine was the failure of its pilots to provide dynamic, close air support to Russian units on the battlefield. But recent war reports have resurfaced. This situation supporting Russian ground troops required Russian pilots to fly at very low altitudes, according to the report. But very few Russian fixed-wing pilots had significant training or money for very low altitude, close air support in disputed airspace because this training in the basic Russian Air Force before the invasion never formed part of the duties of the Russian Army. On top of that, it was clear that some Russian aircraft had known shortcomings with various sensors and weapons that did not allow them to effectively hit their targets. That eyes, Russia has not invested heavily in sensors, weapons and pilot training, which the Western Air Force has acknowledged. After decades of anti-insurgency campaigns where air power provides most of the deployed joint force firepower, the Russian Air Force has not had success since the start of its invasion, mostly due to the flexibility of Ukraine's surface-to-air defense systems. It largely defended Ukraine's skies with its own systems until October 2022. But now, with Western-supplied weapons and defense systems, including US Patriot and Stinger missiles, Ukrainian forces have largely secured their security. But despite all this, it is known that Russia has a significant number of aircraft in its inventory and there is a lot of capacity left. Therefore, all countries should act in cooperation to give Ukraine as much air defense capability as possible. On the other hand, while Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues so badly with both the successful steps of the Ukrainian forces and the support of the US Western Europe to Kiev, some striking speculations continue to surround Russia, especially after Russia's downing of Kinsale missiles with Patriot systems used by Ukrainian forces. Rumors began to leak that Russian President Vladimir Putin would be overthrown with a close glue. The growing popularity of the war, combined with a sinking economy and the staggering death toll, helped fuel the idea that Putin would be forced out of power. According to military analysts, a coup d'etat becomes a real possibility when the political situation changes and the country has a truly unpopular president at its head and war is really undesirable. In fact, no clear information was shared to prove this situation. But Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine did not go well. In addition to the suffering inflicted on Ukraine, Russia has unleashed a number of natural problems upon itself. From a military, economic and geopolitical point of view, the occupation deteriorated Russia's stance. It also profoundly changed the geopolitical landscape facing Moscow in Europe. Similarly, Russian equipment was destroyed. Estimates show that Russia has lost more than 9,000 combat vehicles, namely tanks and armored personnel carriers. And Russia's aggression has resulted in international condemnation, which is manifested in economic sanctions. The result was that the Russian economy was pushed into recession. In addition to the material damage suffered by Russia, this invasion decision also damaged the reputation of Moscow and Putin. 
and this situation has become a pariah in the eyes of the international community. It will take years, if not decades, to overcome the hostility that the war has generated against Russia due to international backlash. So given the disastrous outcome of the invasion so far, the environment is understandably ripe for coup d'etat speculation. However, the probability of a coup still seems low, especially given that Putin is aware of the possibility. Last year, Putin fired more than 100 Federal Security Bureau agents to send a very strong message to those who oppose the war in Ukraine. Similarly, Putin placed the former leader of Russia's Fifth Service under house arrest. You can expect Putin to continue to take steps to reduce the likelihood of a coup. So for now, there is no change in power in Moscow. Maybe Putin can leave power when Russia has no more bullets to shoot than lose a very powerful missile like the console. But then everything would be too late for Russia. There is bad news in the face of the overwhelming attacks from every direction. And because Ukrainian flanks have been compromised, the Ukrainians made a decision to retreat from the central part of Solidarity in order to escape the imminent encirclement. However, the retreat process was extremely difficult. The Ukrainians faced a lot of complications, and here is why. Last time I told you that the Russians managed to develop their attack in the central part of Solidarity which forced the Ukrainians to step back from the salt mines in order to avoid the salient. From that point on, the situation was as follows. The Ukrainians were controlling the salt mine entrances and high-rise buildings while the Russians were controlling the Artem Sol area, central part, and northern outskirts. But the most important developments were happening around the city. Here, the Russians had increased their control significantly, creating a pocket around solidarity. I told you that that night should have been decisive and that the Ukrainians should either conduct a counterattack and clear the flanks or retreat. Today, it became clear that the Ukrainians had decided to retreat. Unfortunately, the situation was developing so quickly that the retreat process did not go smoothly. The Russians had already assumed positions in the central part of the city, so retreating from the high-rise buildings became very difficult. On top of that, the Russians continued pushing from the north. The Ukrainians had no chance but to leave some forces as rear guards in order to ensure that most troops were able to retreat. Russian sources at first reported that they managed to encircle around 500 Ukrainians. However, later, only 100 soldiers soldiers have reportedly been captured. Nonetheless, the fighting in the area has not slowed down at all. It just shifted westward. Today in the morning, geolocated footage of fights show that the fights were taking place near the next industrial area on the line. Prior to that, the Wagners had already shared footage of captured salt mines in the center of the city. Prigazin was present during the capture of Solidarity which made an impression, to be honest. All Russian commanders who had been close to the front line were killed at the beginning of the war. So for the last half a year, all high-level Russian commanders have always preferred safety. So the presence of Prigazin inside the city that is still being stormed is quite unusual. The Russians are also reportedly storming Zil Station, so I do not expect the Ukrainians to hold the second salt mine area for long. When it comes to the third salt mine, the Wagners are not yet developing their offensive in this direction. Now let's zoom out to see the situation around Soldau. Russian sources reported that even though they established fire control over the settlements to the north and south of Solidarity, the offensive operation in this direction is not being developed yet. The main goal all along has been fixing Ukrainian troops and not allowing them to send reinforcements to Soldau. For example, according to Russian sources, by getting close to Blahodat, they managed to prevent the relocation of several battalions. This is not unlikely as the Russians are controlling the local heights and almost all the roads in the region are located in the lowlands. The main obstacles for the Russians in the Solidar area at the moment are the northern, western and southwestern suburbs in particular Paraskeva, Krasnaya, Gora, Blahodaton, Seal, Krasnopolsky and Vasily. 
The good news is that all sources confirm that apart from the rear guards, the Ukrainians have withdrawn all forces and equipment. Some sources indicate that most units have already been relocated to Siversk. Other sources inform that Ukrainian units that left the city have been dispersed in the surrounding settlements, which makes more sense. Most of the surrounding settlements are not stormed yet after establishing control over Horodnia, the only settlement under Russian fire is Krasno Horivka. Overall, some of the best defensive positions in Ukraine have essentially been rendered useless because the Ukrainians could not protect their flanks as the Russians established total control over the high ground around Soldau. The Russians were able to attack the defensive positions from every direction and significantly complicate the plant support. The battle for Sol Dao once again emphasized how critical it is to control the high ground, even in modern warfare.